My name is Natalia Komarova, and I'm a professor of mathematics at the University of California, Irvine. Uh, my main interest is evolution, and uh, I spend a lot of time uh, studying cancer because it's an example of an evolutionary process that is very useful to understand. So today uh, I will uh, present some recent work about the protective effect of aspirin in colorectal carcinogenesis. This work um, encompasses two very different spatial scales. One is microscopic. So what happens inside cells, how mutations happen, how evolution proceeds inside um, small compartments in an organ. On the other hand, we have uh, the scale of populations of people, epidemiology, cancer epidemiology. And uh, it turns out that there is a very clear connection between the processes that happen on the microscopic scale of cells and uh, the epidemiology of cancer. So mathematical tools that uh, I will present uh, allow us to build this connection and ma make a predictive model of what happens uh, in this case when uh, people take aspirin and how this may uh, help perhaps prevent or delay uh, the development of cancer. So I will start with the mathematics of the microscopic scales and briefly explain how we can use various tools to understand evolutionary processes that happen uh, in dividing populations of cells. And then we'll go and connect that with epidemiology. So uh, mathematics of cellular evolution. Uh, I want to start with this very old diagram that shows uh, the progression of colon cancer. Uh, as you can see, we start with normal epithelium and it goes to adenoma and then light adenoma and so on. This process uh, is a multi-stage carcinogenesis and it goes over several mutations that uh, are often present uh, in colon cancer. And I want to attract your attention to uh, two types, two different types of mutations that uh, are there. One of them is called loss of function mutation, and the other one is the gain of function mutation. So the first one uh, is a tumor suppressor gene. Uh, here it's uh, the example given here, it's the APC gene. And the gain of function mutation is an oncogene, in this case, KRAS. So what are these types of mutations? Uh, a, a loss of function, uh, a gain of function mutation is when uh, a mutational uh, process happens in the cell, and as a result, the phenotype of the cell changes and it acquires some advantage. So perhaps it starts growing faster or dying slower. So an example is an oncogene KRAS that's involved in the um, uh, colorectal carcinogenesis, and it's always a one-step process, right? One mutation is enough to create a cell that uh, has these uh, different properties that is somehow fitter than the rest of the population. Uh, on the other hand, uh, a loss of function mutation uh, is a two-step process. So uh, you may know about uh, tumor suppressor genes. There are about a hundred of them that have been discovered uh, in different cancers. Uh, one of them is APC, another one is uh, retinoblastoma and so on. So uh, uh, in, in a wild type cell, uh, the tumor suppressor gene is present in two copies, of course, and uh, its function uh, that is relevant for us is that it prevents bad things from happening. It prevents cells from um, uh, breaking from cooperation, from starting to grow too fast, uh, and so on. So the first uh, mutational event inactivates one of the copies of the gene, but there is still the other one that keeps bad things from happening. So after the first mutation, nothing much happens in terms of the um, uh, fitness of the cell. A one-hit mutant has similar properties to the wild type cell. It, it can be, uh, actually, its fitness can be slightly reduced uh, compared to the wild type cell because the gene performs other functions. So an inactivation may reduce the fitness. And only the second mutational event, the inactivation of the second remaining copy, will result in an in increased fitness of that cell because now both uh, copies are inactivated and uh, the cell starts acting up 
start it may start uh, growing too fast or dying too slow. Uh, so it has an increased fitness. So mathematically, these are very different processes and uh, they have been studied widely. So here I, uh, I will give an example of how we could study uh, loss of function mutation. Uh, so one of uh, important questions is to calculate the rate of tumor suppressor gene in inactivation. It's a two-step process. So uh, how quickly do we expect something like this to happen in a, pop, in a small compartment of a cellular tissue, right? So we always start with a wild type cell uh, and mutations happen very infrequently. So here you can see the mutation rate is in this case 10 to the minus seven per cell division per gene copy. So it's not very often, right? Uh, so uh, uh, this very rare event gives rise to a one hit mutant and then those have to give, give rise to a two hit mutant how long does it take right so uh imagine a small compartment for example a colonic crypt i will mention that later uh and uh cells engage uh in the process of divisions and deaths in this idealized mathematical model uh which we call a moran process each cell division is balanced by a death. So it goes like this. So uh, let's suppose we pick a cell for death. So here it's crossed out, it's gonna die. And we pick another cell at random for division. So it keeps going like this. And some uh, in this um, diagram, we use purple for wild type cells and light green for a one hit mutant. So somehow, uh, we go through the process where each death uh, is um, balanced with a division, so the total population remains constant. And eventually, uh, the second mutation happens, and that's where we say, okay, uh, our event has ha has taken place. Uh, the uh, tumor suppressor gene has been inactivated in one of the cells, and now we have the super mutant that may take over the population. Right? Uh, this could be one of the first events in carcinogenesis. Uh, so mathematically speaking, um, we can formulate this stochastic process. Uh, we, uh, each cell is equipped with a division rate and a death rate, and mutants may have a different division and death rates compared to wild types, right? We can run this, uh, we can run computer simulations that show how this proceeds. So here, um, this slide shows three different dynamical regimes that can occur uh, in this very simple system. So depending on the mutation rate and how it compares with one over n, the population size, there are three possibilities. Here on the left, we start with the whole population being wild type population, as, as we should. Then after a long time, uh, a mutant, a one hit mutant is generated and uh, it takes over. Right, and that sits there. So the whole population consists of uh, one hit mutants. You can see single mutants there. And uh, uh, finally, one of those produces a double mutant and that's indicated in red. Now the whole population consists of double hit mutants. Right? So this is what happens when the mutation rate is very small events uh, compared to one over N where N is the population size. Uh, the diagram in the middle is a different regime. So now, uh, one hit mutants appear and they may linger for a while and go away and linger for a while and go away. But before they ever take over, uh, they create a second mutant and that mutant dominates the population. This is a double mutant, a super mutant that is stronger. So this regime we call uh, stochastic tunneling and it requires some different mathematics to calculate. And finally, all the way on the right, we uh, have a situation where the mutation rate uh, is the largest uh, compared to one over n and uh, from a stochastic process which is subject to randomness we have an almost a deterministic process things always happen in the same way and this is the least relevant regime for us uh, because it, the, the mutation rate is uh, not large compared to one over n in all relevant situations. So uh, we can formulate this problem by using a coarse grade description. I will skip over the details. My point is that uh, uh, 
we uh, create uh, a model where all the rates can be calculated depending on the kinetic parameters, division rates of cells, death rates of cells, mutation rate, and the population size. Right. Uh, so now that was very naive because cells don't live in a box like this. Uh, they um, uh, exist in space. So let's look at the spatial model here. Uh, it's an example of a two-dimensional uh, Moran process where when a cell dies, not anybody else in the population can be chosen for division, but only somebody in the neighborhood, right? So cells in this case know about their spatial location and they can only replace uh, a, a dead cell in their own neighborhood. So it kind of proceeds like this. We uh, keep going uh, until the first double hit mutant is generated, right? And uh, this is a more complicated mathematical problem. So here we present a solution in a one-dimensional case. Uh, uh, and there are also solutions that were obtained by others, uh, such as Rick Durrett in two-dimensional, three-dimensional cases. And it turns out that the rate at which mutants are uh, generated is faster, just because there's uh, space involved. So it has to do with the existence of mutant islands uh, that kind of tend to cluster together and uh, protect weaker uh, intermediate mutants from dispersing and being um, outcompeted by the wild type. Uh, finally, I want to mention a third type of models that have been used to study this process where a little bit more realism is added. So we have to remember that not all cells are the same. There are stem cells and there are differentiated cells and all types of intermediate cells. So in this uh, simplest take on this process, we have a hierarchical structure where uh, there are different stages of uh, differentiation that cells go through. So the, the, here the last cells are removed and then the previous um, generation divides and so on until the stem cell that's kind of sitting at the bottom divides and the process starts over. In this case, we could also calculate uh, the rate of evolution or the rate of uh, tumor suppressor gene inactivation. And it turns out that it's slower uh, compared to the previous two models. So to recap just this part, um, what is the um, kind of take home message from this mathematical work? We can explore different scenarios. We can uh, see how different aspects of the system um, contribute to the rate of evolution, right? Uh, so, for example, we can calculate the rate of evolution and see how it depends on uh, the uh, underlying system. So, this slide shows three lines. It plots the rate of evolution as a, the function of a mutation rate in the three different models that I have mentioned so far. So, the line is in the middle is a mass action model, the simplest one, where we don't have any space, we don't have stem cells, nothing, just a simple box uh, of cells. So uh, if we add spatial interactions, uh, that makes the evolution proceed faster. Uh, but if we add a hierarchical structure, it makes evolution slower. So uh, it's possible that uh, one of the reasons why uh, organs, um, especially epithelial tissues, are uh, characterized with this complicated hierarchical structure. One of the reasons for that could be to delay this un uh, unwanted evolution, to delay the onset of cancer, uh, to push it as far as possible to, you know, have the organism reach the reproductive age and only maybe later develop cancer. This is one of the hypotheses that follows from this mathematical theory. Hierarchical structure delays evolution and helps delay the onset of uh, cancers of uh, epithelial tissues. So uh, this was a very brief introduction to uh, the microscopic type modeling uh, that uh, can be performed and mathematical tools for which have been developed. Here we will apply it to colon. So what type of populations are we dealing with? So on the left here, we have a, a, a picture 
looking at colonic tissue, and you can see it consists of folds like this. They're called crypts. Uh, in the middle, you see an amplified picture or schematic picture of a crypt. It's a fold of cells. And there at the bottom, there are stem cells, which are kind of, of the most importance for us. So that bottom compartment is what you see on the right. This is what we see as our compartment, the, uh, the small compartment of cells. And that's where things take place. This is where all the action takes place. Uh, cells divide and die. They replace each other. They compete. Uh, that's where mutations happen. And uh, this is where um, colon cancer is originated. So in the uh, second part of my talk, I want to connect this type of microscopic modeling with a bigger picture, with the picture of uh, epidemiolo epidemiology of cancer. And in, uh, specifically, I want to talk about the role of aspirin uh, as a possible uh, mean to uh, protect against cancer. Uh, so I will start with some experimental uh, and epidemiological evidence of uh, the role of aspirin and the main central uh, point that I would like to uh, discuss here. So uh, these uh, graphs come from the famous CAP2 trial by uh, Byrne and uh, colleagues that took place in the UK. Uh, they were looking at patients uh, with Lynch syndrome. So that's one of the ways to look into colon cancer. So Lynch syndrome is a, a familial disease where uh, one of the genes uh, in patients is mutated uh, in the germline. So they're born uh, kind of one step closer uh, to colon cancer. So most of these patients develop colon cancer uh, and other cancers in their 40s to, and 50s. Uh, so this is a, a group of people that are at risk, at a, um, uh, increased risk of developing colon cancer. So this is a group of people that was used in the study. And uh, uh, they were split into, the, the subjects were split into two parts. The, the control group received the placebo and others were given uh, aspirin tablets for uh, a, a certain period of time. And then the incidence of uh, the colorectal cancer was recorded. So in the vertical axis here is um, the uh, proportion of uh, the people diagnosed with uh, Lynch syndrome cancer. And uh, the horizontal axis is years uh, since the beginning of the trial. And the blue line corresponds to the control group. So this is the proportion of Lynch syndrome uh, people who developed the condition. And the red is the patients who received 600 milligrams of aspirin. And you can see that there is a significant reduction in the risk of developing um, cancer in, in this group. Uh, okay, so the next slide presents uh, other uh, work that uh, gives evidence to the same point. This is a meta-analysis of effects of aspirin in cancer prevention by Barron and colleagues. So they compiled a number of uh, other uh, of um, results from other research groups. And uh, in the middle, you see those dots. There is a vertical line and there are dots to the left of it. Uh, they look at the relative risk of developing uh, cancer. Uh, by patients that received aspirin treatment. And if relative risk is less than one, it means that the risk is reduced. So you can see all those points are on the left of the vertical line. Vertical line is one. So the relative risk is less than one. So uh, we have a reduced incidence of cancer in those patients who were given aspirin. Finally, I want to pre present the third and main uh, piece of evidence that is most relevant to our own study. This is the study of Andrew Chan and, and colleagues. It was a large study uh, of uh, a large co cohort of nurses. Uh, they looked at those dependent, those dependent risk reduction uh, of colorectal adenoma in these uh, uh, subjects. Uh, in this table, uh, you can see um, First of all, um, the 
some demographic uh, data about the participants and how many they were. It's a large study. And the second table uh, shows risk reduction uh, in developing of uh, adenoma depending on the dose. So we have uh, zero tablets per week, uh, half to one and a half tablets per week, two to five tablets, six to 14 and more than 14. So 14 tablets per week is two tablets for day, per day. So it's not um, a very, it, it's a large dose, but it's uh, something that people may take. It's uh, okay. So uh, you can see that uh, the strongest dose uh, taken per week led to a 50% reduction in the risk of developing uh, late uh, colorectal adenoma. So you can see 0.49 um, as a relative risk. Uh, so this is what we would like to explain. How does this work? Can we use mathematical modeling to explain this? It's a collaborative effort. Uh, I want to speak a little bit about my colleagues. So we have uh, two experimental collaborators. Uh, it's uh, Aji Goel and Rick Boland. They are oncologists uh, uh, who study uh, gastric cancers. Uh, and uh, uh, theoretical colleagues are Dominic Waters from UCI and a former postdoc, uh, Yifan Wang from UCI as well. So we have uh, published a couple of experimental papers with some mathematical um, estimation of parameters. The first study was an in vitro study, then an in vivo study, and uh, most recently, we published uh, a mathematical study that kind of uses the uh, experimental results to develop mathematical theory. So I will first mention uh, the uh, setup of the in vivo aspirin study. So our colleagues used mice and they planted uh, several different uh, cell lines as xenografts. They used different uh, dosages of aspirin treatment for those mice, and they looked at the growth curves of the tumors uh, uh, under different dosages of aspirin. So here is a photograph of those uh, tumors that they measured as a function of time. Uh, these graphs are on the right. This is the tumor volume as a function of days, how quickly it grows, and the different curves correspond to different dosages of aspirin. The top curve is no aspirin and the dose decreases uh, as we go down. So we wanted to extract kinetic parameters of cell division and death from these curves. So the equations of, on the left show how we have set it up here. This is a spatial model because this is a solid tumor growing in a three-dimensional space. So there are two unknown parameters, L, the division rate of the cells, and D, the death rate of cells that we were able to extract from these measurements. And here are the, uh, the, the result of fitting of the mathematical model to um, the experiments is on the right. And uh, here's the main kind of result um, uh, from uh, this study. The graph on, on the left shows the death rate of cells uh, as it changes with aspirin dose. And, and you can see for higher amount of as, amounts of aspirin, the death rate of cells increases. The second graph is the division rate of cells. And you can see that as we increase the aspirin dose, the uh, division rate of cells decreases. So there are two things that we saw happen to cells uh, under the presence of aspirin. The cells, uh, one of the effects of the aspirin is that it increases the death rate of cells. And the second effect is that it in, uh, decreases the uh, division rate. So basically it reduces the fitness of the cells and we quantify it exactly by how much, right? We have this quantity of data uh, showed the extent of this effect in, in uh, xenografts. The graphs on the very right are similar results that we obtained in the previous study in vitro. So both results uh, are the same. So we could measure um, the extent of the change in the parameters, kinetic parameters of cells as a result of different aspirin doses. Uh, 
Okay, so what we are trying to do here is we want to explain how aspirin may affect the incidence of colorectal cancer. And the information we have is how it affects kinetic uh, rates of cells that uh, we measured. The, these graphs here, uh, especially, the, the, let's take a look at the black dots. This is age incidence curves for uh, adenoma in the general population. This is in the absence of aspirin treatment, just the general population. This is um, some ep epidemiological studies that have been performed, a large amount of data. So now uh, we want to combine this with the results of incidence reduction as uh, a function of aspirin dose. And we want to explain the reduction in the age incidence curve. Okay, so uh, how do we do this? The idea in this latest work was to create and parameterize a model of late adenoma generation, implement the effect of aspirin through modification of kinetic parameters, which we measure, connect that with epidemiological population data and me measure uh, aspirin-induced risk reduction. And then we will be able to see if our uh, measured effect of aspirin can explain the, the reduction in age incidence curves. So this is the type of model that we're going to use um, uh, microscopically, right? This, this is the uh, small scale model except uh, compared to what I talked about at the beginning of this talk, it's going to be a little bit more complicated. I went over several very simple models and I explained how we can model just one uh, type of event, a loss of function event, a tumor suppressor gene. So this is here. If you look at the um, diagram on the bottom left, it has six different states, states one, two, and three, the top row uh, denote the transition from a wild type cell to a cell with one copy of a tumor suppressor gene inactivated, and then to uh, cells with both uh, copies of tumor suppressor gene inactivated. So this is APC minus uh, minus. These are cells that have lost their tumor suppressor gene. Going down, there are states four, five, and six. They have an additional mutation, which is an, uh, a, a gain of function mutation. This is an activation of an oncogene, KRAS, that is also implicated uh, in uh, uh, late adenoma. Uh, so the bottom right state, state six, that is encircled in the red, this is what we assume the late or advanced adenoma to be. They have both copies of the APC gene inactivated and the, uh, the oncogene KRAS activated. So three mutational events lead there. Uh, also included in the model is the uh, process of crypt fission. So uh, before I was talking about constant population, but uh, now we are going to include a biologically observed process where modified, genetically modified crypts that are partially mutated can actually divide and the whole population increases as a result. So this is what uh, is shown in this diagram. We uh, used a previously published model uh, uh, as uh, a starting point that, uh, so this model includes the six states that uh, I mentioned. And the, the most important state, state six, is the advanced adenoma. This is what we're going to focus on. And the, the great thing about it is that a lot of parameters of this model have been measured. So this work would be impossible to perform, say, five years ago or 10 years ago. We tried, but we failed because there were too many unknowns. Now a lot of parameters are known, so we can fit the model very well. We had to modify the model to. Um, fit our purposes. Uh, we included some non-linearities. Uh, and so just to show you the result, uh, these graphs uh, or in, on the left and in the middle show the error of fitting. And there is a large valley. So there are many parameters that uh, parameter values that correspond to a very good fit. 
So we cannot say that we found like a unique parameter combination that uh, you know corresponds to the the, uh, the model that is best fitting. We, we found a range, and that's okay. So whatever work we do, we perform with the whole range of parameters. But we found a very good fit. The graph on the right shows the uh, uh, observed incidence uh, of late adenoma in the absence of aspirin and the lines are the best fits there are many of them but they, they all um, fit very well so now uh, the first question we asked what is the most likely pathway and this is still in the absence of aspirin right what is the most likely pathway that takes us from wild type cells to late adenoma cells how is this um, what is the most likely sequence of uh, mutations that leads us there. So on the uh, top left, we have a diagram that shows the yellow pathway. So first, uh, the two copies of APC gene are inactivated, and then we go down, uh, the um, oncogene is activated. Or we have two green pathways, also three steps, but in a different order. And so uh, we performed fitting with uh, both types uh, of sequences of events. And the yellow pathways turned out to be the uh, best fit. So we conclude that according to our model, uh, it is most, li most likely that the first event in the progression to late adenoma is the inactivation of the tumor suppressor gene, which is then followed by an activation of the oncogene. Okay, so now let's uh, include aspirin in the model. So we are going to uh, consider uh, a certain period of time from T start to T end where we administer aspirin. And then we measure the resulting incidence of uh, late adenoma in such patients. Uh, so how do we incorporate uh, aspirin in the model? Uh, we uh, uh, use the information that we obtained from the experimental studies. Uh, and we just say, okay, during aspirin treatment, the division rates of cells are going to be affected in this way and the death rates of cells are affected in that way and uh we know exactly by how much uh, they change uh, what what is the um relative change uh for each aspirin dose so this is uh, summarized here in the table uh, uh so this is our model and uh we uh consider two types of effect that aspirin can have on cells first of all it can be intracrypt dynamics uh, so inside crypts, cells divide and die faster. Okay, so this means that when aspirin is administered, all these rates that are encircled in, in red are going to change in, in the fashion that we can predict. Okay, we, we know how much they change. Also, aspirin can affect the fission of the crypt because cells divide uh, slower, they die faster. So something is going to happen to this uh, rate of uh, crypt division. So that is going to be reflected in the change in these other coefficients. And uh, this is uh, uh, the result, uh, uh, a number of results that this model gives us if we assume that aspirin has both effects. So you can see that uh, in these graphs, the green uh, regions is the age uh, when we simulated the um, aspirin uh, intake by people. We use the largest dose here, which is more than uh, two or more tablets per day or 14 or more tablets per week for 10 years. The black dots uh, denote the uh, age incidence curve as it was measured and is, was fitted by our model. And the yellow curve is what we predict will happen if aspirin is taken during the uh, period of time in green. You can see that the earlier aspirin treatment takes place, the larger is the reduction in the incidence. The uh, yellow curve uh, is lower for those people, for those um, agents uh, that we simulated agents that took aspirin earlier on in their lives. Uh, if uh, it is predicted that taking aspirin from 50 to 60 still makes a big difference, but uh, 60 to 70 is the effect is a little bit less and 70 to 80 it's even less now the next slide explores the uh, role of aspirin dose and we can see that we can put in the parameters that correspond to light dose medium dose and strong dose 
And we can see that with the strongest dose, the effect could be up to 50%, exactly as uh, was observed in the uh, under chance studies of uh, the cohort of nurses. Uh, but even uh, the intermediate dose also uh, gives uh, a significant effect. Um, this uh, slide ex explores the effect of the length of treatment. So obviously the longer uh, the treatment takes place, the larger the effect. So this slide compares uh, 10 years of aspirin treatment uh, versus five years of aspirin treatment. The diagrams on the right, uh, the, the um, uh, plots on the right show in blue treatment in five years and the yellow treatment of 10 years. Five years uh, is not as effective, but it still is a significant effect, especially if it's taken earlier in life. Um, here, uh, uh, it's more of a theoretical question, right? So what exactly are the processes that are affected by aspirin? Is it mostly intracrypt dynamics? Is it intercrypt dynamics, crypt fission? Uh, so we explored both. And uh, this slide shows that the largest effect uh, is observed when we assume that aspirin affects the crypt fission. Uh, so this corresponds to uh, the largest reduction in the age uh, incidence curve. To conclude, um, our previous in vitro and in vivo work indicated that aspirin reduces the rate of colorectal tumor cell division and increases the rate of death in, in a dose-dependent way, up to twofold. Uh, then we did some mathematical modeling, and uh, the analysis demonstrated that parameter change within our experimentally observed range can lead to an up to 50% reduction in the age incidence curve uh, of uh, late adenoma. The model it identified the dose, treatment duration, and the age at which treat treatment was started as important determinants of protection. So. Uh, Further studies will uh, confirm exactly in which way uh, these fa uh, factors uh, influence uh, the reduction, but we uh, identified the pr predicted uh, value. So we conclude that the aspirin-induced uh, changes uh, in cellular fitness that we observed can, in principle, explain a significant reduction in, in risk. So the, it doesn't mean that we've uh, considered all the effects of aspirin. Obviously, uh, there are other things that happen. There's a mutagenic effect of aspirin that may uh, contribute. There is also this whole um, uh, issue of um, um, inflammation in aspirin, which uh, is not part of the study. We just looked at the simplest measurable effects of how aspirin affects division death rates. And we showed that this can have a significant effect on uh, age incidence curves. So if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to enter those in the uh, Q&A box, and I'll be happy to respond to the, those by email. Thank you very much.